Patricia and I moved into our present house in Frinton in the spring of 1988. And in the Easter holidays, we invited our dear friends, Peter and Kay, to come and stay with us in our new home. I've mentioned before that they are keen walkers. And so we, on one fine day, drove down to the Red Lion in Kirby and began a circular walk, which was going to take us most of it along the sea wall overlooking the backwaters. And at one point, Peter started to scramble down towards the, uh, the tide, high tide line. He stooped down and he picked something up and he scrambled back up and showed us his find. And here it is a paint spattered old plank. What on earth do you want that for? We all cried out almost in unison. And then he turned it over and this is what it says. If I take the wings of the morning and then less clearly and remain in the uttermost. What was it? Where did it come from? What was the meaning of the words? Peter knew well, we got and we thought that it was probably a verse from the Bible. But anyway, we got back home and we um, we looked up in the concordance, and there it was. The verse came from Psalm one hundred and thirty nine, and Patricia is now going to read some selected verses from that beautiful Psalm of David. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Amen. Back in November, when I preached on Psalm 103, I quoted C.H. Spurgeon, who likened it to an alp above all other alps. And for Psalm 139, he uses a different metaphor. The brightness of this psalm is like unto a sapphire stone. It flames out with such flashes of light as to turn a night into day. Now, Peter's paint splattered plank may not have sparkled like a sapphire, but the quotation carved into its surface shines ever so brightly. If I take the wings of the morning. Now, even I, as a scientist, can appreciate the poetry of that phrase. But what does it actually mean? Let me try and explain. Imagine you're standing on a mountain top, and here is a view from the top of Scarfell in the English Lake District. At the very moment you glimpse the rim of the sun rise above the horizon, you turn around 180 degrees, and its light has already hit the mountains, which used to be behind you. What David is actually saying here is that if he could fly as fast as light, and that's 186,000 miles per second, he could not escape from God. And our verses 7 to 9 tell us that however fast, however high, however low we travel, we will never remove ourselves from the presence of God. It doesn't matter whether it's day or night, mountain top or ocean deep, God is still there. We might not know that, but he has never, nor will he ever, leave us. 
Now, I think that's so well illustrated in the poem The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. There are 182 lines in that poem, so I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to read just a few from the beginning and then some from the very end. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him. The footsteps of the hound of heaven followed and finally they meet. And the voice of Jesus speaks. Rise, clasp my hand and come. Halts by me that footfall. Is my gloom after all shade of his hand outstretched caressingly? Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest. I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love from thee, who dravest me. You drove love away from yourself. You who drove me away. I love this description of the poem. As the hound follows the hare, never ceasing in its running and ever drawing nearer in the chase, with unhurrying and imperturbed pace, so does God follow the fleeing soul by his divine grace. And this is me now. The person being pursued had spent his life running after everything that the world had to offer. He turned his back on God. Yet Jesus pursued him and never, go, never gave up on his quest. Quest? Yes. His divine purpose was to bring one who was lost, alienated from God, back into God's family. And that is still his purpose for everyone and for all the lost sheep. When I was preparing this sermon, I had a strong feeling that there could well be somebody here today listening to this or watching who doesn't know Jesus as saviour. You might know a little bit about him, but that's as far as it goes. Well, here is an important message for you. Whatever you have done, However far from God's ways you might have strayed, God loves you so much he has never, nor will he ever, abandon you. He's right there, willing for you to turn around and take his hand and walk together into whatever the future holds. God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus into this world with one main objective, to go to the cross and die for you. As Stuart Townend put it so eloquently in his song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Miraculously, Jesus took the punishment which we all so richly deserve upon himself. He paid the penalty, the death penalty, on our behalf. Now, many of us hearing this will know this already. We have trusted Jesus and accepted the gift which is beyond price. We know that he has loved us despite the wrong things that we've all done. But some might say, oh, but God can't possibly love me. He can't possibly know what I've done, and if he did, he couldn't love me. Well, here's the remarkable truth which we find in this jewel of Psalm 139. Listen again to the verse 13. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. And the next verse, your eyes saw my unformed body. One of the great privileges of being a science teacher was that we were expected to teach our young pupils about reproduction, human reproduction. And how blessed was I to be able to access an amazing film depicting the development from conception to birth. 
And here's one photo from the film showing the fetus at 20 weeks, halfway through a pregnancy. So even before we were born, God saw us and knew all about us. And that continues throughout our lives. God knows us inside out. And the psalmist expressed that through his opening verses. And listen to how the Message Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bible in contemporary language puts it. I am an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back, I am never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say, even before I start the first sentence. I wonder how you feel about God knowing you that well. An atheist, one who doesn't believe in God, would hardly give it a thought. There's no such thing as God, so why should I be concerned? But as a Christian, or even someone who believes in God but is not that sure about where Jesus fits in, it must give us food for thought. If God does know us, all about what we do, say or think. Does it not prompt us to try and not do the things which we know we shouldn't and do do the things which we know we ought to? And when, when and not if, we do stuff up, and we all do, when we have fallen from grace, let's not try and hide it. Let's say out loud or in our heads, oh God, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And the wonderful thing is that he does. And we could add to that prayer. Please, God, help me to do better in the future. And because he loves us, he will help us. And what a blessing that is. Looking back at this beautiful Psalm 139, and we've only scraped the surface today, we can sit in awe and reflect that God knows us. We're not a number on a spreadsheet. He knew us before we were born. He knows all our faults and failings. And yet God loves us with such a passion that we can never fully grasp its intensity. <clears throat> and there is nowhere we can go. We can never place ourselves outside of that love. And we know that for a fact. The Bible tells us this, and we find it in Romans 5. Whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And John, in his first letter, says this in chapter 4. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Wow! Thank God for Jesus, our beloved Saviour. And may his wonderful name be glorified in and through us in the years that we have ahead of us. And may God's blessing be upon each and every one of us and all those whom we love this day and always. Amen.